Christian Carl Gerhardt's writer's name became known for his fraudulent schemes back in the 20th century. The story of German adventurer Christian, more familiarly known by the alias Carl. He was born in West Germany on February 21, 1961, but he himself claimed to have been born on February 29, 1960. His parents' names are Simon and Ermengarde, they are a painter and seamstress, and they have another son, Alexander. The family was needy and poor. Karl grew up in the Bavarian land in the German commune of Siegsdorf. This place is remarkable and beautiful because of its large forests, snow-capped mountaintops. The population of the town is not very large, a little more than 8,000 inhabitants. Everyone knows each other. But little Karl never liked it. He liked to be surrounded by people, and to be a leader there, all the attention should be attached to his person. At school, he was fond of chemistry and electronics. He was a very smart child. Carl's main goal was to move to the United States to become a Hollywood star there. When Carl was 17 years old, he met American tourists Elmer and Jean Cologne. The family was traveling through West Germany. They told the young lad about their country and how beautiful it was. For Carl, this acquaintance was a huge success. These stories further solidified the goal of going to the United States. From that moment began the fascinating story of Christinian Carl Gerhardt's writer, which is full of lies and crimes. To enter the States, Carl used the names of tourists and registered as a high school scholarship applicant and that he was an exchange student. And this first deception succeeded, he was believed, and the U.S. Embassy issued a visa to enter the countries. That was 1978. The next destination was New York. For this, he traveled to Connecticut, where he chose as his first victim the family of Edward Sage. To them, he introduced himself as Christian Gerhardt Ryder and told them that he came from a wealthy West German family. From that moment on, his first experience in creating a fake identity began. Edward and his family believed Carl and allowed him to stay with them while he was going through high school. He stayed with the Sage family for a year, but they were forced to say goodbye to him as Carl had exhausted their patience. Carl did not become discouraged, much less return home, and in 1980, he went to Hollywood to fulfill his childhood dream and become an actor. But it did not work out, and a year later, he came to the north of America, Milwaukee, located in the state of Wisconsin. There he called himself Christopher Kenneth Gerhardt. Carl entered the University of Wisconsin. There he met his future wife, 22-year-old Amy Jersey Donkey. A short time later, through another lie, Carl married Amy and gained American citizenship. His lie was that he convinced his girlfriend that he needed citizenship. If he didn't get it, he would have to go back home to West Germany, where Carl would be taken into the army and sent to fight in the Cold War on the Russian front. The day after the wedding, Carl left his young wife and went to California. Amy immediately filed for divorce, indicating that Carl had abandoned her. In 1984, Carl was living in the city of San Marino, which is located in Los Angeles County. There, he identified himself as Christopher Chichester. He took the last name from a teacher he had in high school. Carl met the family of Jonathan and Linda Sohus and immediately moved into their home. It was the same as with the previous victims Carl wormed his way into the trust of this family. Carl kept in touch with his family for a while, and in a phone conversation with his mother, he told her that he had changed his last name because it was difficult for Americans to pronounce his German last name, Gerhardt's writer. At some point, he stopped making contact. In his hometown, rumors began to fly about Carl, that he had opened his own company in the States. But in fact, Carl had nothing. He lived off his deceived victims. Everyone believed in Carl's deception, but in 1985, something strange and inexplicable happened. The Sohus couple disappeared. When the investigation began, Carl was detained behind the wheel of a truck that belonged to Jonathan, but the police never got to question him. He managed to leave the neighborhood. During the investigation, Carl was seen as a person of interest in finding the Sohus couple. He had been telling neighbors that Jonathan and Linda had gone on a trip to Europe. The proof was a postcard the Sohus had received. There was no evidence for recognizing that the couple was dead. Carl remained at large. Carl's next destination was Greenwich and he moved there, calling himself by a new name, Christopher Crow, and that he was a television producer from Los Angeles. In fact, there was such a producer, he created the famous 80s television series, Alfred Hitchcock Prisons. Carl introduced himself as a descendant of the English royal house. The fraudster had not only courage, but also the ability to learn languages and acting talent. Therefore, 
He easily perfected American English and began to wear clothes from famous brands. It remains unknown where he got the money for all this, but most likely he got it through fraudulent schemes. Later, Carl got a job working with computers in a famous brokerage firm, Phelps & Company. But it quickly became clear that Carl was not who he claimed to be and that he was not a descendant of an English house. The truth was revealed thanks to a social security number. The insurance number Carl gave belonged to serial killer David Berkowitz. Christian Carl was immediately fired. Next, Carl took a job at Nico Securities as a corporate bond sales manager. But just as quickly, he was fired from there. His next job was with another brokerage company, but later he quit there on his own. After a while, he learned that he was wanted by the police, immediately gave up the name Christopher Crow, and to his former colleagues, he told the story that his parents were kidnapped abroad and he needs to go there to negotiate a ransom and achieve their freedom. A few years passed, and Clark invented a new interesting story. He became Clark Rockefeller. This identity did not need to certify and explain, because with this name, he was open to all the doors of high society in New York. He told everyone that he was a member of this dynasty of oil magnets and knew German very well, even though he had never been to Germany. He also claimed that his parents had died in an accident. Klar also said that he was an independent banker and that his income came from several Asian countries. No one even doubted his story. Everyone believed him. Karl boasted that he had alleged friendships with various artists, businessmen, and politicians including George Lucas, Britney Spears, and German Chancellor Helmut Kohl. He also claimed to possess the master key to all the buildings in Rockefeller Center and that he was in charge of the new bond department at the Wall Street Bank. To confirm his wealth, he claimed to live in a luxurious apartment with paintings of his favorite artist, Mark Rothko, hanging on the walls. Naturally, all the paintings were fakes, but no one dared to ask Carl to show certificates of authenticity because he claimed to have inherited them from his great-aunt Blanche, the widow of John Rockefeller III. This story had enough impact on Sandra Boss, who fell in love with Carl and fell into his trap of deception. Sandra was a high-ranking executive of the consulting firm McKinsey & Company, who was educated at Harvard and Stanford. Clark Rockefeller and Sandra Boss married in 1955. Clark was then referred to as James Frederick Mills Clark Rockefeller. The actual ceremony was legally invalid. It was unfair to Sandra since Carl never gave out the information and his real identity. Carl insisted that Sandra file her tax return as a single person, rather than as a family to get a more favorable tax break. Sandra was the only source of income, but even so, Carl hired an accountant to handle the company's finances without including Sandra in the process, and only he handled her earnings. From the looks of it, Clark and Sandra were a very happy family, living in a luxurious home in New Hampshire. In 2011, Sandra and Clark had a daughter, Ray. New Hampshire used his fictional family connections to the Rockefeller family. He also revealed that he was a wealthy Yale graduate and currently owned a business in Canada. He used his charisma to become a member of a prestigious Boston club, where he spent most of his time impressing everyone with his promising affairs and superior wealth. However, the truth was that all this money belonged to his wife, and the con man managed it to live the royal life, surrounded by luxury, fancy cars, clothes from fashionable brands, and many other accessories of wealth. He came up with the perfect excuse in front of his wife and private club friends. They said his fortune was trapped during the Cold War, and he could not return to save his fortune, since returning to Germany meant he would be forced to serve in the army. Due to his character, Carl successfully won people over with his charm and amazed them with his incredible stories. But as time went on, all his lies began to come out. From his greed, he became more emotional and angry. Carl accused Sandra of making very little money for them. After such accusations, Sandra began to suspect that her husband Clark Rockefeller's story was very strange and mysterious. And she hired a private detective to find out the whole truth. He succeeded. He found out that Carl is not who he says he is. At the time, no one knew his real name. After receiving this information in 2006, Sandra decided to divorce, officially changed her daughter's name, and accused Carl of lying about his connection to the Rockefeller family. Members of this dynasty denied any connection to Carl. Due to the situation, Carl decided to capitalize on it for himself. He agreed to give custody of his daughter to Sandra, and he himself had the opportunity to see her only three times a year. 
and that under supervision. In exchange for this, Sandra agreed to pay Carl $800,000, give him two cars and her wedding ring, which was fixed in the agreement. Carl's mistake, which led to his exposure, happened after his divorce from Sandra. Carl's ex-wife moved to London with their daughter. There, Carl could only see his daughter three times a year under certain conditions that were stipulated in the divorce agreement. During one of these meetings on July 27, 2008, Ray and her nanny went for a walk in Boston. At one point, a limousine pulled up beside them. Carl got out of the limousine, walked briskly toward the daughter and the nanny, pushed her away very roughly, and forcibly took Ray into the car with him. The nanny tried to stop the limo with her own strength. She tried to hold the car with her hands, but she ended up being dragged a few meters and fell. Charles ordered his driver to drive faster, and they managed to get out of sight just as quickly. Under his new name, Charles Smith, he bought an apartment where he brought his daughter Ray. To the public, he began to present himself as a single father who came from Chile. His ex-wife immediately went to the police, where she reported that her daughter had been kidnapped. After Sandra's statement, the police immediately went in search of Carl. An Amber Alert was issued for the child's disappearance, and the Baltimore Police Department also filed a manhunt for the fake Clark Rockefeller. During the search, it was discovered that Carl had a yacht that was parked in a marina under the care of the owner of that marina. The owner recognized Carl from the wanted photos and notified the police. The police officers decided to go for a ruse and lure the scammer out to the marina. To do this, they contacted him and informed him that the yacht was sinking. All this happened on August 2nd, a week after the kidnapping of the child. After the call, Carl got ready to go to the harbor, and when he left the apartment, Boston police officers stopped him. Ray was found in the apartment alive and unharmed. The kidnapper was taken to police where he was charged with kidnapping a child against her will, as well as an assault charge. But Carl was not intimidated by anything. He still made up new stories as well and claimed his mother was an American child actress from the 40s, Ann Carter, and also claimed she was dead. It was all made up again. This story was publicly denied by Ann Carter herself. The kidnapping of the child caused a great resonance and the case was widely publicized in the media. Pictures of Carl were distributed everywhere. After that, witnesses began to appear who recalled the false stories. He was also recognized by his own brother, Alexander. The FBI tried to find out about Clark Rockefeller's background and the real details of his past life through the media with a video that asked agents to tell the true identity of the man. On August 15, 2008, officially the FBI, Massachusetts State Police, Boston Police Department, and Suffolk County District Attorney made an announcement that Clark Rockefeller has the real name Christian Carl Gerhardt's writer. They found this out with the help of the FBI laboratory in the Virginia town of Quantico and forensic examinations there. Boston police lifted Clark's fingerprints in custody. The prints were matched to others they had gotten from various sources, and they matched prints taken in Boston from a wine glass. They were collected during the search for Rhea and Carl. The task was as difficult as possible. It was necessary to trace Carl's entire path all the way back to early childhood. The investigation found a fascinating immigration file that began in the 1980s. The lab was able to identify latent prints on this file. It also found additional evidence that had gotten lost among the 1984 case file, the case of the disappearance of the Sohus couple. This evidence helped to finally bring this tangled story to a close. Investigators discovered that Carl was not only a con man, but also a very dangerous man. The new owners of the Sohus home where the alleged oil tycoon lived started building a pool, dug a hole in the backyard, and found three bags there, most likely containing human remains. Forensic examination proved that the bones belonged to Jonathan Sohus. At the time, the couple's son Sohus stated that Carl had always taken advantage of his parents. The body of Linda Sohus was never found. Police claimed that Linda was also murdered as well as Jonathan. Also, the police speculated that Carl did all this to cover his tracks and so that no one would know his real identity. Carl still continued to maintain that he was innocent. On September 3, 2008, Carl was charged with providing a false fake name to a law enforcement officer at the time of his arrest. A month later, Carl's attorney asked the judge to consider a motion to reduce Carl's bail. At the time, bail was set at $50 million. The motion was denied, and the court announced the decision to revoke the possibility of bail altogether. In mid-2009, a trial began in Boston, 
where Carl was to be charged with kidnapping his daughter, assault, and assault with a firearm. But as it turned out, another charge of providing false identification was added. The trial was presided over by Judge Frank Gano, and he prohibited prosecutors from mentioning the So Who's Missing Persons case to avoid prejudicing the jury against defendant Carl. Carl's defense stated that their client was most likely mentally disturbed, proven by the fact that Carl believed that his daughter Ray called him from London and begged him to save her. Two experts diagnosed the defendant with delusional disorder and narcissistic personality disorder. Dr. Kate Abloh, who was one of the experts, stated that Carl had told her about his father's psychological abuse as a child. The evidence of Carl's attorneys was contradicted by Dr. James Chu, a psychiatrist who was on the prosecution side. The psychiatrist also announced that although he diagnosed a personality disorder with narcissistic and antisocial traits, Carl was able to distinguish good from bad and vice versa. James stated that Carl planned the kidnapping of the child in great detail, and if he had been mentally ill, he would not have been able to think it through. At the trial, Carl exercised his right to remain silent and his ex-wife spoke instead. She said that in the beginning of the relationship between the spouses, everything was fine, but later he began to control every step and accused her of not earning enough. She also said that after these words, she decided to check the words of her ex-husband for truthfulness and her investigation led to the disclosure of several serious cases at once. Not only Sandra spoke out, but the limo driver also spoke out. He laughed at Carl and called him extremely strange. On the day Carl stole his daughter, he paid the driver $3,000 to help him drive him and his daughter home. On June 12, 2009, a jury found Carl guilty of unlawful imprisonment of a child and one count of assault and assault with a dangerous weapon, which was a limousine. On the second count of assault and providing a false identification, Carl was acquitted. Judge Frank Gano sentenced Carl to four to five years in prison for kidnapping the girl and two to three years on the assault charges, which were to run concurrently. Although the first trial went quickly, the case that involved the Sohu's couple was slower. The first grand jury was convened in the spring of 2009 to only consider evidence of Carl's guilt. The next session didn't take place until two years later, in the spring of 2009. That's when the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office charged Carl with the murder of Jonathan Sohus. It wasn't until March 2013 that the trial began. Carl's defense, represented by attorney Jeffrey Denner, argued that Linda Sohus took the life of her spouse Jonathan, as his client had no motive to get rid of Jonathan. And he also claimed that the crime would have been the stupidest crime in Southern California history because the packages in which Jonathan's remains were placed were packages from the universities Carl attended. But Assistant District Attorney Havid Valian disagreed with the defense attorney's arguments and noted that if the motives for the crime are unknown, it does not absolve the defendant of guilt. According to prosecutors, Carl was believed to be involved in the deaths and had evaded trial for 30 years. The evidence in the case was mostly circumstantial, but the jury, however, felt that the two packages that were found with the remains were strong enough evidence since the packages were from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and the other from the University of Southern California, where the defendant was a student. That wasn't the only evidence. There were also witness statements and police records that noted that Carl stole Jonathan's car after committing the crime. It wasn't until April 10th that the trial was completed. The jury reached a verdict in which they said Carl was guilty of first-degree murder, and the aggravating factor of using a deadly weapon to take the victim's life was added. When Carl was found guilty, he fired his attorneys, and during sentencing, he defended himself on his own, insisting he was innocent. On August 15, 2013, Christian Carl Gerhardt's writer's sentencing hearing was held in Los Angeles Superior Court. Judge George Lamelli denied the defendant's petition for a new trial and sentenced Carl to life in a maximum security prison with a minimum term of 27 years, after which Carl could apply for parole and he was eligible to reduce the minimum sentence to 26 years for past time served on a child kidnapping charge. Members of the Sohu's family were present at the trial and were allowed to express their opinions after the verdict was announced. Jonathan's sister took the floor and addressed Carl, telling him that she was sure of her involvement in Linda's death, even if he was never proven guilty. And she also stated that she was satisfied with the judge's ruling. 
Christian Carl Gerhardt's writer was placed in Norkern State Prison in September 2013 and was transferred to Ironwood State Prison in March 2014 for unknown reasons. In 2015, Carl appealed and his sentence was reduced to 26 years, but this was not enough for him, and he filed two more appeals on October 23, 2015 and January 20, 2016, which were unsuccessful. No more appeals can be filed by Carl as he has exhausted all state remedies. In December 2016, Carl was placed in San Quentin State Prison, where he remains today. When he is 68 years old, he will be eligible for parole. That won't happen until December 2029. In spite of everything, Christian Carl Gerhardt's writer became a kind of real star of cinematography, as he dreamed in childhood. Only he himself did not star in a movie, and on his life story made movies, from which box office receipts amounted to about $6 million. Carl still continues to insist on his innocence in the accused crime, and even gave several interviews where he claimed it.